Hello, everyone, and welcome to What to Expect from the Great American Outdoors Act. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Jason Georgiorian, and I'm a principal at LGA Architecture. I'll be your moderator today. I want to give you a little bit of background information to the Fireside Chat series. We started the Fireside Chat uh, at the beginning of quarantine when the pandemic first hit. And it's, it, for us, it's an online open forum and where we can make connections with our community leaders and hopefully provide some answers to what is going on in the world around us. Last month, we held a chat on parks and recreation and we discussed how connecting to nature and connecting to our parks is essential for our emotional, social, and physical well being. And we have seen in the past, uh, during similar financial downturns, such as the one we're in now, how park services are one of the first things typically cut in a budget. Well, the Great American Out Outdoors Act is the most unlikely silver lining in this pandemic. And this is great news for us. Many of us have dealt with the quarantine void by connecting with the outdoors. And we know now more than ever how important outdoor recreation is to our health. Today, we'll hear from another great group of panelists about what they expect in the future and find out what this act may mean for us all. Now, just a little bit of webinar logistics before uh, I turn it over to Craig. Everyone is muted if you're uh, watching this. However, there's a Q&A button on your Zoom screen. I encourage you to ask questions at any time. Uh, we'll do our best uh, to get those answered within this hour. And finally, we were recording this chat um, after today, we're going to download that content, package it up for you. And next week, you'll see an email uh, with a link to this chat in case you miss any section of it or, or if you just want to watch it again. And uh, this may be your first fireside chat. Um, in that same email, you'll find a link toward the LGA homepage and to the rest of our fireside chat and other webinar content. So I encourage you to watch anything if you missed it. So uh, please enjoy today. I'm going to turn it over to Craig Galati, and he's going to get us kicked off with the panelists introductions. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Jason. Well, thank you very much for showing up again today, guys. We really appreciate it. Um, we've uh, worked hard to get this panel uh, lined up, and um, it's pretty exciting. I'm going to go ahead and quickly introduce them, and then we'll jump right into the content, because I think that's, that's why you're all here. Um, Congresswoman uh, Susie Lee is going to be joining us as soon as we, she can get logged in. Um, I've seen her kind of pop in and pop out a few times, so they're, they're trying to work on that. But I'm going to just quickly uh, introduce her as well. Um, she was uh, originally from Ohio, and uh, she went to Carnegie Mellon University, and she worked uh, a, her own way through college to pay for her education. She ended up moving to Las Vegas in 1993, where she became an educational nonprofit leader. And she, her passion at the time was to improve education system, decrease school dropout, and provide after-school programming for Nevada students. And that, during that career, that taught her to take on tough problems and roll up her sleeves and work together to do that, which is what she's taken to the Congress. Um, she's fighting to improve our education system, honor our promise to our veterans, and tackle rising health care costs. Um, she represents District 3, which is a big chunk of Southern Nevada, uh, including Las Vegas. And it's exciting. She still lives in Las Vegas. And it's exciting to us because she was one of the co-sponsors of the Great American Outdoors Act. Um, next panelist uh, is Mauricia Baca, and if you've been involved in any conservation thing in Southern Nevada or even in Nevada at all, you know Mauricia's name. She's very much connected to what's going on in, in, the, in the world of conservation. Uh, she has almost 30 years of experience working across a wide range of environmental and community issues. She became the executive director of Get Outdoors Nevada. Some of you may still know it as Outdoor Las Vegas Foundation in January of 2010. Has it really been that long? Um, previously, she worked with the Nature Conservancy in their Nevada chapter leading Southern Nevada's office. One thing you may not know about her, she's actually is also uh, an attorney and served as a trial attorney for the United States Department of Justice um, through uh, 2000 and 2004 in the Wildlife and Marine Resource section of the Environmental and Natural Resource Division. So thank you for uh, attending, Mauricia. Uh, Janice Keeler is the Deputy Administrator of the Nevada Division of State Parks. She's got a background in renewable natural resources, been managing federal grants for the past 10 years. This is an important uh, component because she currently works for State Parks 
and has been managing the Land and Water Conservation Fund for Nevada for the last four years. She's lived in Nevada for 20 years, has five kids, um, and enjoys mountain biking, uh, triathlons, riding, traveling, and spending time with her family and friends. And you'll learn throughout this that there's a strong connection between the Great American Outdoors Act and the land and water conservation fund. So that's, uh, thank you for coming in, Janice. And then Colin Robertson, last but not least, um, is the inaugural administrator of the Nevada Division of Outdoor Recreation. It's a new division that um, was created um, through AB 486, um, and it's located within the Nevada Division of Conservation and Natural Resources. Um, the NDOR works to ensure all Nevadans can live healthy and active lives enriched by outdoor recreation. So I know that with our panelists, all of these, um, these items are really critical to connecting to this Great American, American Outdoors Act. Um, so I'd like to go ahead and start with some questions and we'll jump right into this. Uh, and the first one is really for Mauricia. And I'm wondering, Mauricia, if you can give us kind of an overview of the act. Hello, Craig, it would be my pleasure. Um, I know there, I have a feeling we have a few people on the call who have been working on this for a long time and may have some experience, but I'll give you an overview. Um, and a little anecdotal is I've been engaged on working on the Land and Water Conservation Fund for about the past 10 years. So this act uh, is close to my heart and I know there are at least a few folks out here on this call have probably been working on it for decades upon decades. So on August 4th, President Trump formally signed into law the Great American Outdoors Act. Um, our Nevada senators were leaders on this in the Senate and our full delegation voted yes in the House of Representatives. It was very exciting to see the Nevada delegation coming together. As you noted, Congresswoman Susie Lee who's gonna be joining us was one of the co-sponsors. And uh, the question is though, we're all really excited about it. What does the Great American Out Outdoors Act really do? Really in brief, it basically directs revenues from federal age energy development to our public lands. So the money is going to be deposited into two funds, the National Parks and Public Lands Legacy Restoration Fund and the Land and Water Conservation Fund. Uh, right now, those funds are primarily oil and gas that that's coming from. So it's oil and gas lease funds, not taxpayer funds. Um, the Land and Water Conservation Fund, which is one of those sources that's going to be receiving support through the Great American Outdoors Act, has been one of the most popular public lands funds for actually more than 50 years. It was it was it, its inception was in 1965 and the program has purchased federal lands and funded recreation projects we have many of those in nevada and i know janice is here so i'm not going to try and speak to those she'll get she'll help us bring it bring us up to speed on that um, as i mentioned the lwcf is funded by royalties from gas and oil exploration it was supposed to be funded at 900 million dollars a year but it was never fully funded at that level and it could be used for a land acquisition, um, for grants made to states for outdoor recreation purposes and for other purposes. Um, in 2019, the fund was actually permanently reauthorized. It had been allowed to lapse, but it was still dependent on Congress to actually appropriate energy resources into the energy revenues into the fund. So basically in 2019, it was an empty house that was created, but there was no furniture in that house. With the passage of the Great American Outdoors Act, the full $900 million for the first time is actually allocated to the Land and Water Conservation Fund as, as mandatory spending. And at least 40% of the annual appropriated money would go to federal land acquisition. Roughly 40% would be granted to states for recreation purposes. And then the remainder can be used and appropriated at the discretion of Congress. So for those of us who've been working on LWCF for a long time, it's exciting. It's uh, one of those funding sources that I know I've always felt is makes so much sense. And it's especially important for many of the places in our state that, for instance, may not have something like the Southern Nevada Public Lands Management Act, or they're looking to um, enhance some of the park resources and trail resources that need a little bit of extra funding. So our state is hopefully looking forward to getting some additional funding. Um, the other component is the National Parks and Public Lands Legacy Restoration Fund. That addresses overdue maintenance across our national parks, forests, wildlife refuges, and other public lands. Um, it, right now, overdue maintenance totals about $20, $20 billion with a B. 
Um, the bill for the National Park Service alone is roughly triple the agency's annual budget. Um, more than 21,000 miles of parks and trails need repair. So until now, Congress has not had a specific discretionary fund for this. Um, the discretionary budget for parks actually increased just 1% in inflation adjusted dollars over the past decade, even though 20 new, de new units were added. So this National Parks and Public Land Legacy Restoration Fund will fund directly fund deferred maintenance needs. Uh, it will, the dedicated fund will receive half of all revenues from oil, gas, coal alternatives and renewable energy development on federal lands and waters that are not already obligated to other needs. And that's up to $1.9 billion per year over the next five years. So half of the energy revenues roughly would go into the, um, that would normal go, normally go into that general treasury will now be put into the um, and legacy restoration fund. So it's exciting to see that type of funding coming and I think it's a strong statement for the importance of our outdoor resource, resources. And I think as a number of us were chatting as this was getting going, so many of us have been finding our solace in the outdoors during this COVID period. And it's also underscored a lot of inequities in, in communities that very much need investments in park and trails. And so I think many of us are looking forward to LWCF being deployed to help maybe fill some of the gaps for those communities and to generally um, improve our natural places and our community's quality of life. So that's my over overview for you of the Great American Outdoors Act. Wow, wow, Marisha, thank you very much for that. At, at, uh, it's such a fantastic thing and welcome Congresswoman Lee. Um, we're so glad to have you and thank you for, for being here. Um, I really wanted to ask you the next, next question. So, um, and thank you for being a co-sponsor of this legislation. And so the, the question really is, is why did you agree to be a co-sponsor of this? And what do you think, it, it, what do you hope it's gonna do for our country? And specifically, what is it gonna do for Nevada? Uh, well, first of all, I think that this, uh, the Great Outdoors Act is so incredibly important for the state of Nevada. Um, you know, we have, uh, what is it, 80, 5% of our lands are federally controlled. Um, but more importantly, we have incredible outdoor spaces. And uh, this funding is so important for us to make sure that we increase access uh, for many of our residents in our state. Um, for me, this is really was a per, you know, many things it's, it's important for our state, but more importantly, this is personal to me. Um, uh, many of you know, I grew up, I'm one of eight kids and I, uh, my mom literally kicked us out of the house every morning and we'd have to go access the parks behind our house. And, and so I had the opportunity of having access to the outdoors. Granted, what, like, I thought it was like this huge forest when I was a kid. It was, it's just a small park, but it was sort of my, it was my relief as a child, but in probably instilled in me my love of the outdoors. And uh, like you said, I mean, so many people have been pushed into really appreciating and accessing the great assets we have in our state. And uh, whether it's mountain biking or at Lake Mead or Sloan Canyon, Red Rock Canyon, you name it, um, we have so much that we need to protect and for, for generations to come. And, uh, and honestly, listen, this fund is supported by oil and gas leases. And so it is basically taking what, you know, could be what we would ter all term a really bad thing for our environment and turning it into a benefit for our environment. But more importantly, as a freshman member of Congress, I think that I've been more frustrated than not than how long it's taken. And all of you know, because you've been working on this for so damn long. Uh, but ultimately to know that we have a permanent source of funding and that we don't have to keep coming back and going after this fight again and again and again. And so um, to me, I just think um, during this pandemic, seeing people literally have to basically discover the beauty that we have right out our back door has been a silver lining in this horrendous chapter in our life that you know people are forced to go for a hike or go on a picnic or get outside and so 
I'm actually excited about the opportunity. Like, I think this is a tectonic shift in our society right now. And I think that one, uh, families understanding that, gee, I don't need to go out to dinner every night. I actually can cook myself and we can enjoy each other's company. But more importantly, uh, we have so many beautiful, especially in Nevada. I mean, I grew up in Ohio. And when I came to Nevada, I really did not appreciate the beauty of the desert. And uh, having been here for 25 years, I can't imagine not having that resource. And so um, I was a proud sponsor of this. I will continue to be a loud uh, advocate for our public lands and making sure that we open up access. I think you made uh, an incredibly important point of the disparity in people having access to open lands as well. And I think that that's something that we need to continue to fight for um, because ultimately it is about our health, it's about access, and it's really about having these opportunities. So, and I just wanna, first of all, thank you all and your firm. Uh, you guys have been such a leader in our community and open spaces and our public spaces and uh, the beauty, um, in not just natural, but the beauty that you create. So thank you for all you do and having this important forum. Thank you very much. We so appreciate you being here. Um, my next question is for Janice. And so Janice, I know you've been working in this fund for a long time and, and managing grants for even longer time, but what does this mean now for, for your uh, de department and division? Well, I was thinking of this um, as everyone was talking, and since we actually we manage and oversee the program for Nevada, what I I know this is going to be a lot of work for us. So, but it's it's going to be good work because I absolutely love this program, and um, what I envision once we actually are appropriated more funding from the Land and Water uh, Conservation Fund. We will be able to have bigger grant rounds, award bigger projects. Right now we're limited. We tend to not award really huge amounts of money at one time, but I think we're gonna be able to do that more readily this, you know, once we do get our apportionment. We don't know how much it's gonna be yet. There's various um, ways of calculating the amount, but it could be anywhere between 4.5 to $6 million, which is, it's, uh, double to triple what we're getting now. And so it's going to allow us to fund more outdoor recreation projects for both the state and for local governments and tribes. And I, I just really look forward to getting a, um, started on that. There's just so many projects that we want to fund and we just don't have the money to do it right now. But, and I think one important thing, and I know Maurice is aware of this, is there's a 50-50 match requirement. Um, and so right now when a lot of budgets are being cut, um, I'm a little concerned that a lot of the, the jurisdictions won't have the match money. So um, I'm also part of the National Association of State Outdoor Recreation Liaison Officers, and we are trying very hard to um, get the match reduced for about five years from 50% to 20% to allow the, the jurisdictions to be able to use the money more readily. There's actually money left on the table at the end of the year the entire program across the country because it, there isn't enough match. So hopefully we can get that accomplished. But, but yeah, I'm excited about this um, and I appreciate everyone's involvement and in getting this accomplished with Maurice's effort and uh, Congressman Lee. It's, it's great to get all the support for such an important program. Yes, thank you very much. It is such an important, I, I really am glad to hear that you're looking at seeing if we can reduce the matches. You know, the, I, I, I remember coming out of the, the last recession, um, the ARRA money really put a lot of us to work and a lot of people to work. And I can see the same thing happening with here is that this doesn't just create opportunities for outdoor uh, at recreation, which it does, but it also creates jobs for people to work on these projects and help you know maintain trails, build trails, do things like that, that really is, is so helpful um, for so, much, so many people in the economy right now. I so, agree, Craig, and I kind of compare this to the Civilian Conservation Corps oh, that yeah. was uh, meant to help recover from the Great Depression. 
So hopefully this will have a similar effect. And oh, can you good. guys hear me okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's great. So my next question is for Colin. And Colin, so you have a brand new department. So I was wondering if you could just maybe, a lot of us may not know what your department does or what it's about. If you can give us a quick snippet on that. And then what does it mean, this act mean for you? Well, thanks so much, Craig. Um, yes, the Nevada Division of Outdoor Recreation is a brand new department, a division of the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. And I am proud to be the inaugural administrator of the of the new Nevada Division of Outdoor Recreation, which has been a, a super uh, experience and privilege thus far. I started uh, about six weeks before the quarantine lockdown came into effect. So I got about four weeks of solid uh, traverse, tra uh, ability to traverse the state and see a lot of uh, Nevada. But uh, since then, it's been a little bit slow going on the field trip side of my job. Um, the Division of Outdoor Recreation for the audience's sake was created uh, as a result of legislation in a 2019 legislative session uh, under a bill called AB 486, which stood uh, created the Nevada Division of Outdoor Recreation and some of the regulations surrounding it. Um, what's important about it is that Nevada became at that time the 13th state in the country to create an Office of Outdoor Recreation. Uh, they have largely been created over the last three years, uh, three and a half years or so now. Um, and there are a couple more to come uh, in, in this uh, sort of immediate future in the next couple of months. Minnesota and Indiana are uh, on the short list of states working to create their offices. Um, but there are currently 15 offices of outdoor recreation formally. And there is kind of an informal alliance of those offices called the Confluence, the Confluence of States, which Governor Sisolak deputized uh, Deputy Director Dominique Echegoyen from the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources to sign Nevada on to. And so the meaning, the sort of important part of that uh, accord is that my office is created with four kind of core guiding principles as kind of foundational uh, um, values, if you will. Those are conservation and stewardship, economic development, health and well-being, and education and workforce development. So those four pillars, uh, if you will, are the kind of guiding framework that I am using to decide what I can and will work on and what I have to kind of wait until I have some more capacity because I'm an agency of one uh, until I'm not, um, which is actually quite an exciting opportunity. Uh, but I thought I would give just one example right now uh, as to how the Great American Outdoors Act relates to the work that I'm doing. Um, and, and I obviously, I work very closely with Janice and, and, and Mauricia is uh, one of the founding members of the advisory board on outdoor recreation uh, for my division, which is, uh, it's tremendous that we get to talk like this about these great topics. Um, but in the early time that I've been in this position, I have been working pretty hard to uh, see how I can use the Division of Outdoor Recreation to advance Nevada's outdoor recreation economy and also the sort of infrastructure and opportunities and, and access uh, that people across our state need uh, to, to sort of increase uh, the reputation and, and sort of footprint, if you will, of outdoor recreation in Nevada. Uh, to a lot of Nevadans, it's not a question that Nevada is an outdoor recreation state, but to a lot of people outside of Nevada, we're more known as an indoor recreation state than an outdoor recreation state. But there is an, there's interesting evidence to the contrary. In Congressional District 3, uh, there is more, more than $1.8 billion of annual spending by residents of Congressional District 3 on outdoor recreation pursuits. And that's a significant economic impact for the whole district. And it's a sizable con contribution to Nevada's overall economic impact of outdoor recreation. And I think that this is sort of uh, part of the evidence of why it's something that we need to take more seriously as a component of Nevada's stability and uh, recovery coming out of this COVID impacted situation uh, moving forward. So one of the ways that I've been working to try to help do that is uh, I have had the opportunity to work closely with 
some folks at the Economic Development Administration. And we are working with a team of community, community leaders from Ely, Nevada. Uh, we are applying for a grant from the Economic Development Administration's CARES Act funds to create a strategic plan and an implementation plan for a trail building institute to be housed at Great Basin College in Ely, on the Ely mm. campus. And what that would do is basically uh, sort of simultaneous to the creation of the Great American Outdoors Act is provide training opportunities for professional, the professional skills necessary on both sort of the ecological side and the construction side for trail building and maintenance at a time when there's gonna be greater investment in outdoor recreation infrastructure directly as a result of the Atlanta Water Conservation Fund dollars sure. coming to Nevada. So that's just sort of one example of, I think of the kind of work that I am involved in that's directly related to the great news that we are gonna get double or even perhaps triple the amount of investment in our, in our beautiful state. Wow. That's that's really great. I, I'm glad, so glad to see the forward thinking of how we can how we can do this. Um, so now I'm going to go to questions that you guys can kind of round robin a little bit. So please jump in. But I, I do want to start this one with with uh, with a congresswoman. Um, so it's just kind of a mouthful. But so this is the first time that we've been guaranteed full since 1964. And so what what made this bill gain so much bipartisan support? Um, and did the pandemic play a role in the overall perception of outdoor recreation as a, as essential service? Yeah, listen, I, I, you know, I think that um, obviously in Congress with a lot of pressure on oil and gas, uh, you know, with talk of the Green New Deal, with more and more move to renewable energy, it was sort of a lay the uh, lay a marker that um, we're going to give something back. And so I think that that, you know, it was a combination, a lot, a lot of what happens in Congress, as you all know, Mauricia, you know, uh, takes years and years of building coalitions. And it's, you know, you have to work with one group and work with one state, et cetera. And finally, you get sort of like the magic moment. And I do think that um, ultimately was combination of Democrats having control of the House. Um, Joe Cunningham was the sponsor of this bill. He's a good friend of mine from South Carolina. He's part of the Problem Solvers Caucus, which I'm a part of. It's half Democrats, half Republicans. Uh, we endorse this bill. Um, you know, we we don't endorse a lot of bills, but that brought along 50 people from the get go. And I think like having that was sort of started the ball rolling. And ultimately, I do think that uh, this pandemic made people realize how important uh, their outdoor spaces are. Um, I really, Colin, I really love uh, your forward thinking about workforce development and trail building and the skills. Um, I'd love to work with you on that. I think that I've always been pounding the table on economic diversification in Nevada. And, you know, even though it's tourism based, our outdoor economy is so important. And uh, I will remember that figure of $1.8 billion uh, that my constituents have uh, contributed to this economy. Um, but ultimately, I, I do think it's a combination of um, you know, pressure on the oil and gas industry, the pandemic, but ultimately the work of a bipartisan group who was really committed to pushing this forward. And so, you know, I'll continue to uh, pound the pavement on, we got to work together on these issues. We have got to come together on things that are so important uh, to America and to, Amer you know, to our citizens of our country. And I think that this was a fine example of that. Great, thanks. Does anybody want to jump in on this one? I have a couple thoughts, Craig, if I could. Yeah, please. Um, one is I'll remember that Congresswoman and, uh, and reach out. I'll appreciate any. any uh, you know, I'm on the Ed and Labor Committee, so <laughs> higher I'm, ed as well. So <laughs> I'm I'd love to help out with that. that. I think um, among other things, the Governor's Office of Economic Development in Nevada had planned to release a five-year strategic plan 
for the state's uh, kind of growth. And that got gummed up by uh, a little virus and the resulting economic disaster that has, re that has resulted has just been uh, atrocious, frankly. But what's really good news in the, in the kind of thinking that has evolved uh, as a result of it is that GoEd is including outdoor recreation economy as a thread of both their stabilization and recovery plan, which is an 18 to 24 month uh, kind of mini strategic plan for coming out of this. And then also as a core thread of the next five year strategic plan thereafter. So that's a big deal uh, because for example, in Southern Nevada where you all uh, are, uh, I talked today with a young man named David Bonilla who runs a outdoor recreation industry business called Take a Hike Vegas that is struggling drastically right now uh, because of the impacts of the virus, but has a long view of how coming out of the pandemic induced recession, uh, outdoor recreation businesses like his might be uh, able to help diversify the economy generally in Nevada and, and bring us, uh, I think, some some greater um, stable, sort of more stable and sustainable economic fabrics, which I think is really exciting. Craig, this is Mauricia. I'd love yeah. to jump in as well. In terms of your question about how COVID-19 may have impacted perceptions, I, I think uh, it's always exciting when you can see something bipartisan. Um, the outdoors should be that. I mean, really, we're, we're all here under the sun, moon, and stars, and it's important, but I think COVID has underscored, as nothing has before, how critically important that access to the outdoors are. Um, so many people have been getting outside to local parks and trails. Our, our, our public lands have experienced a little bit of heavy use, and so it's also underscored how desperately those places need support for maintenance and care. Um, but I think people have learned a whole new appreciation. I know I've had so many conversations with folks who had never really been to their local parks and trails and Congress talked about that and people being brought out. Um, I'm out there every morning. I've always been out there every morning and you know, walking five or six in the morning and I overhear people walk by me saying, I never knew we had these great trails. This is so nice. Um, and so for me, I think I, I look forward to, um, it's exciting to finally see this commitment. Um, I think it's a great statement of how important our outdoors really are. It's important for our economy. It's important for our health. It's important for our community and community cohesion. Um, so seeing that happen in Congress was just, it, it was exciting. Um, it's great to have our full delegation voting in favor for it. And I think it's exciting to see um, as we move forward how we can then apply that to ensure that, as I noted earlier, that there's as much equity as possible in terms of that access. Because we have seen, unfortunately, we do still have communities that don't have enough access to the outdoors and where, you know, like I'm lucky enough to be able to go out and we'll go walking really quickly. I, I, I live in Henderson, I've got beautiful trails nearby. There's some folks in uh, more downtown urban parts of Las Vegas, for instance, they don't have a great safe place to walk. A lot of their kids don't have a great safe place to go play in a park and have that experience, which is so critical as, as the congresswoman. I also, um, my great park was Central Park as a little kid. And then I came out here and fell in love with the, with the West. There are a lot of kids, unfortunately, here in Nevada and around the country who don't have their own special park in their special place. So it'll be exciting if we can leverage funds like LWCF to create those experiences. Janice, do you want to weigh on on this one? But I am going to ask you the next question. So, um, well, one of the things that I, I think the pandemic has um, done to us is create a lot of stress in our lives, anxiety, and I think the the um, way people have been handling that and alleviating that is going outside, and I think it's made them more aware of the the mental and physical health benefits of the outdoors that maybe they didn't realize before because that's mm -hmm. how they're dealing with the stress that they have and they're getting outside and you know on a state parks level we've just seen huge numbers at our park lines to get in people jumping fences you know they just need to get into the park and then on a personal level i i ride my bike on the trails in carson city a lot 
I cannot tell you how many people I've seen since the pandemic started. It's just, it really has grown tremendously. And I, and I, I'm hopeful that people will continue to, to go outside and not that this isn't just a temporary change. Yeah, you know, I remember years ago reading Last Child in the Woods and, and um, you start to think about the notion of nature deficit disorder and things like that, that kids play on their screens all the time. And, you know, now they're going to school on their screens too. And so I, I think this notion of getting out is so good for them. And who would have thought that a coronavirus maybe might help lead to the cure for these kids in terms of understanding and appreciating and beginning to love nature like all of us on this call do. Quick um, jumping in, Craig, on that. The yes. fact that bicycles are sold out. Bicycles of all sizes. I, and to walk into a store and see all the kids' bikes sold out, I, stuff like that. It's like, as you said, it's, it's incredible to see kids out and moving and exploring. Yes, it's amazing too. I just went to buy a new tent and same same thing. There's The tents are gone everywhere, big five or, so I mean, I had to order one online, which, which you know, I wouldn't have ever thought that. And um, and I just needed a new one, not not a, not the first time, but you're right. It's amazing. So I'm, I'm going to direct this first question to, to Janice and then you guys please jump in. But, you know, I don't know if you guys keep stats with the state parks, but you know, have you seen a really noticeable increase in terms of camping and, and people getting outdoor recreation at the at Nevada parks? We have seen the parks filling up faster. I mean, I don't know how much faster they can fill up at Lake Tahoe and Valley of Fire, but they do. But I think the difference is we are actually not at full capacity. So some of our busier parks were just um, restricting to only 50%. And so mm. the parks are filling up sometimes by 8 a.m and you just can't get in. And that's, that's what we've been seeing. So the demand is still there. I think, in fact, it's probably higher, but um, I think there's opportunities a little bit less in some of our more popular parks because of the capacity restrictions. Anybody want to jump in on that? I mean, you guys, Marissa, have you seen, I mean, how you just mentioned how you've seen more people out and about. And... Yeah, um, I know. Talking when you speak with the public lands managers, they're not able to get full counts, but um, many of them are seeing double or more the number of people than they've seen in the past. I, I believe a, one of the participants on this call is Greg Weitzel at the city of Las Vegas, and that Floyd Lamb Park is one of the few where they can actually get counts, and their number is ballooned to I think something along the lines of 50,000 people in a month, which is was unheard of before. Um, I think another amazing example is the bike program that the Regional Transportation Commission of Southern Nevada has been running. Their previous high point had been, I think, around 3,000 or so. And in May, they had 29,000 uses of their bicycles before the heat hit. So it just demonstrates how much people have just been needing to get outside when you see that kind of exponential growth. Um, Neon to Nature is an app that we have with the Southern Nevada Health District. And the number of downloads has like quadrupled for people looking for local trails. So they're definitely seeing not just anecdotal, but numbers totaling up for the just expanded interest in being outside. Wow. That so, has, Colin, yeah. Craig, I just might add that that has yeah. come with some conservation impacts that uh, also need to be thought about in the context of the Land and Water Conservation Fund dollars because the sheer volume of people who have you know, for, for the most part, really been uh, beneficially impacted by spending time outside, also are having some impacts on, on uh, resource impacts that are really important to um, prepare for and plan for. And um, th th especially because uh, so much of Nevada is managed by the Bureau of Land Management, uh, which has in many cases 40 year outdated uh, re re recreation management plans um, that has to become a priority of the Department of Interior um, and to really push toward developing and investing in these resource management plans and the travel management plans that kind of come from them because it reduces the impacts on uh, trails. It, it basically consolidates impacts onto trail systems rather than onto uh, the natural resources uh, else, elsewhere in a given site. 
So it's really important that we get a grasp of that because the plans are, many of them in Nevada were created when and, and operable when I was in the fourth grade. And <laughs> lots has changed since that time. I'm not that old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it's funny. I, I live right near Red Rock Canyon. And um, so I grew up, grew up here. I remember when Red Rock Canyon was hike only. Uh, there was no road. And, and, you know, now I see the steady stream of cars and it's amazing how many people, you know, well, they have to sit and wait before they can get in. And, um, but it's still one of the, one of the places in Southern Nevada that is so cherished. And I hope that uh, people are taking care of it when they're in the, in the park and uh, leaving no, no, no trace, if you, so to speak. Um, well, so, listen, it was yeah. sort of interesting. Like, was it last summer or last fall? I mean, the, the lines to get into Red Rock Canyon were just like, it was unbelievable. And then during the pandemic, when they completely closed Red Rock Canyon, I, I understand why, but uh, it was sort of fun to, I actually wrote it backwards, which was sort of fun to do at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, just a different way to do it. But, um, you know, it's just, um, it's incredible to me, I think, one thing that I've noticed, I don't know if you guys have noticed, I've seen like four rattlesnakes this year. I have never encountered a rattlesnake in Southern Nevada. I mean, it's, I don't know if it's just like, they're coming out because of the pandemic or whatever. No, I'm just joking, but, <laughs> uh, but listen, I mean, I think that, um, you know, I, the conservation issue is huge. Um, you know, when you think about the resources that we have, uh, we have vast resources, uh, but what's accessible to people is rather limited. And so I do think that, um, you know, taking a proactive role and looking at that is really going to be important. Um, on, along these lines, just I'm throwing this out there, I'm doing with uh, Save Red Rock an electric bike tour of Lovell Canyon coming up. So if you guys, any of you want to join me, I think it's like uh, Labor Day weekend that Saturday we're going to do. So love to have you join. Oh, great. Hey, uh, Jason, I, I see there's a few questions coming in on the chat. Do you want, you want to go ahead and ask a, a question from the audience? Sure, one second, Craig. So, um, I want to make sure we get some of these answered because a couple of them are actually yeah, yes. ones I thought we had on our list too. So I'm not sure this first one can be answered uh, directly, but the first question we have is how quickly will this funding be implemented? Well, I guess I could try to answer that. It depends on how quickly Congress can uh, make the appropriations. And so what what has to happen is they all of these agencies have to give um, provide a list of their priority projects and then um, the president submits the proposal and then congress has to make those appropriations and so the way what i'm hearing right now is that there may be a continuing resolution um, where these decisions might be made in, in a new congress so it could be it could be early next year. Great. Um, another question, and um, maybe uh, once once the funds are available, is there a list of projects or a list of priorities uh, how to use the money once once it's available? Well, that that is something that we have. We have a state comprehensive outdoor recreation plan, and the, the purpose of that plan is to determine what Nevada or any other state's priorities are for how they will use the land and water conservation funds. So we are, Colin and I are working on getting um, a new one written that will start in, it will be due the end of next year. But um, as of right now, we still have an active one. Our, we have about seven top priorities. And so when we actually get our grant applications, we, we rank them according to our priorities. And so that's how we determine what project, projects to fund. And if anyone's interested, and seeing that document, it's on our parks.nv.gov website under land and water conservation funds. Great, thank you. We Great should also maybe add that there's a little bit of, <clears throat> it's a complex calculus about the funding scenarios. So mm -hmm. there's a approximately 
for easier math, approximately half of the LWCF dollars go to the state side and half goes to the federal side. So call it $450 million to the federal side. And that is funding that's basically uh, prioritized towards land acquisitions. And then the $450 million on the state side, so Nevada's four and a half to $6 million uh, apportionment comes out of that total is aimed more at outdoor recreation infrastructure as a priority. Um, and so it's really important in a state like Nevada where we have so much public lands that are managed by I, principally the Bureau of Land Management, the US Forest Service, and to a lesser extent, the National Park Service uh, to be able to work closely with our federal agency partners because they're using their funds and uh, acquire, you know, presumably working towards land acquisition uh, possibilities. But if we can work together with those federal agency partners, we might have a greater impact uh, using both sides' resources. And we can also use uh, our state money for acquisitions also. So. Great information, thank you. And I, there's one more question I'd like to ask. Uh, this one's for Congresswoman Lee. How much appetite is there in the bipartisan committees to address climate change? Uh, listen, I, I, you know, first of all, we're dealing with an administration that has rejected the science behind this. But I think when you look around what's happening to, you know, in our own state with uh, weeks of 114 plus temperatures, I think we're at like 50 days of above. 100 degree temperatures in Las Vegas, uh, the fires in California, the hurricanes that, while not, I, I think the data is the, the frequency has not increased, but the severity has increased. Um, you know, there's Republican members that represent Louisiana and Texas. And I've always maintained that we tend to focus on the coast when we talk about climate change rather than the interior and you're thinking a reduced yield in our farming, in our agriculture, in our breadbasket states, uh, but more importantly, the frequency of the fires. I mean, now it's not uncommon to be in the Western United States and have smoke-filled skies in August and September. Uh, and so I can't imagine any member of Congress who, whether you're Democrat or Republican, who does not see this happening and um, climate change is now um it, you know ultimately to me it requires and this is not a political call but it is a change in leadership and um this leadership of this administration has um, basically rejected all science and i believe that just even you know we have passed the uh our our clean um uh, actually, it was just introduced, uh, Marcy Kaptur just introduced our big uh, report out of the House of Representatives, and we're getting ready. And so we line it up, um, but you have to bring people along. And But ultimately, they're feeling the impact now as well. I mean, when you have, when you're sitting in Louisiana and you're seeing two hurricanes come at you at the same time, that's unprecedented. And, uh, and so I think that the, the experience of living it is going to change minds. But I think it's incumbent upon us to start to look at parts of this country that we've traditionally ignored around climate change because either they're not seeing and, and uh, their water levels rise or they're not seeing fire action. But I will tell you, I, I'm good friends with Congress members from Iowa in our breadbasket and they're seeing, you know, the derecho storm in Iowa that, you know, has obliterated uh, parts of Iowa. So I'm just saying that the evidence is pretty clear, but ultimately it needs to be less politicized and we need to start talking about concrete actions that we can take. I believe that getting in, back into the Paris Climate Accord is a baby step and that we have major actions that we need to change, uh, need to take at this moment. And so I feel that there's gonna be a change of administration and it should be one of our first 100 days of action items that we take up. Thank you. I, I'd just like to say the 
what you mentioned about the severity of what we're seeing happens and how that's actually accelerating the issue and it's important to take action. So thank you for your response. Well, I'm gonna move you to a couple of concluding questions. We're getting close to our time. Um, boy, time flies when you're having fun, right? Um, do you think that this level of federal investment uh, is a trend we can, we can expect? And do you think that, uh, what do you think this, what does this mean for future generations? You know, we're all here looking out for our kids and trying to make a better place for them. Listen, I think that with any investment, whether it comes from federal, state, or local, it has to be stewarded well. And it has to be spent efficiently and effectively. And um, I believe that if it's abused and if it's not spent well and it's, it does not show that it's having an impact, that it will become an easy target when times are tough. I mean, we have just spent trillions of dollars basically preventing our economy from bottoming out. There is going to be a moment where people look at our deficit and start to look at programs that need to be cut. And so I think it's incumbent upon us to demonstrate that these are essential uh, programs and that the money is spent well and that the impact that it has uh, is, a, is, a har, uh, is a strong ROI. And so I, always, I, I never feel that there, anything uh, is completely protected. And I certainly feel that, um, you know, we need to be strong stewards of the money and make sure that we spend it well, that it's spent efficiently, but more importantly, that it has a, a positive impact that people of our community and of our country can, cannot live without. Well said. I would also add that $900 million is the same amount of money as it takes to buy eight F-35 joint strike fighters. And the United States has a fleet of 2,200 of those aircraft. It's a lot of money and it's an important investment, but we're, it's, a, it's the tip of the iceberg in terms of what is necessary for, for some of our efforts, I think. Um, but I also wanted just to bring a couple of pieces of legislation that do suggest that there is a greater interest in and an awareness of the need for these investments. One is called the Recreation Not Red Tape Act. Uh, there's another called the SOAR Act. And the third is called the Mapland Act. And those are all pieces of legislation that are in kind of negotiation still, uh, but they, they are kind of coming on the tails of the Great American Outdoors Act in a way that does suggest positively, I think, that people are thinking about investment in outdoor recreation infrastructure uh, and the, the need to diversify access to public lands. So take a look at those. Uh, Craig, I guess uh, I, I would add a, to the point of, can we expect that type of investment? I think it's more that we, we should try to, we should expect it. And, but Demand. it's up to all of us to advocate for it. I, I think, uh, seeing that what's happened recently is a result of people recognizing that the outdoors aren't just an add-on, it's not just something, it's not foofy, it's essential, it's critical, it literally is critical to our survival. Um, and it's worthwhile investing in and caring for, but it's not something that we can just sit back and expect. We have to really advocate for it and we have to demonstrate, as Congresswoman Lee said, that we're going to steward it and we're going to care for it. and. Um, and show how much these investments matter over the long haul. So that's a great segue to my final question and we'll kind of close on this one a little bit, um, but how can we as companies, as firms, as citizens, how can we help you guys? How can we help you guys manage this money, manage it well, and how can we help be advocates for the future? I'll jump in on that one. Um, I would say as a citizen, if you see your um, leadership doing things that you don't agree with, that you need to um, speak up about it and let them know you don't agree. Um, I think as far as land and water conservation fund program goes, what I have been seeing is um, cities and counties that actually have received the money 
for parks, they decide that they want to put something else on that park land and it's, it's called a conversion. And so, so they may maybe make housing on the park, but um, put cell towers, but it's, it's one of those things where if you see as a private citizen that something is happening that you don't like, it's so important to speak up because um, you, their voice is important. And I know a lot of things have, have gone different directions once the citizens have found out what was actually happening, so. Thank you. Excellent point. I feel that, you know, when it comes to Congress, we really are about the resources, but it really comes down to local governments and watching your city councils and your townships, et cetera, uh, for a lot of these land use decisions. And, um, uh, you know, I always say there's no more important voice than that of a constituent. And that's so true. And it, uh, it's not just for me as a member of Congress, I think it's for your city council members, et cetera. So, um, you know, understand that we have power and power comes in numbers and uh, you can use uh, your position, you can use your company, you can use your networks to get people out to voice their opinion. I think that was a great point. I think, Craig, too, in your firm's work and the work of designers and architects and landscape architects uh, of all different stripes is ex and urban design and so forth are super important uh, threads to how we measure and change quality of life indicators for how people live, especially in places like desert environments like the Las Vegas Valley, that if people know how to live more sustainably in their place, um, we, we also get uh, quality of life indicators that are tied to things like outdoor recreation as, a, as an added benefit. And those, those sort of more comprehensive approaches to design and planning are super essential and will help us deal with some of the climate threats as well. So it's, uh, I think, advocating for for the design being a driving force for change is a really valuable uh, component of the whole effort. Thanks. Well, guys, I want, first of all, I wanna thank you all for being here. But more importantly, I wanna thank you for what you do. What you do every day that benefits the citizens of Nevada, benefits all of us of having access to outdoor recreation, having the ability to go out and, and enjoy the, the wonderful spaces that we have across this whole state. So I wanna thank you again for, for both of those things. And I don't know if anybody has any concluding remarks um, or anything you wanna to say to, to the people on the, on the chat and, and then we'll wrap it up. Well, I'm, I'm just gonna uh, sign off and say thank you all for all you do. Uh, you are leaders in this movement and have been working many years. Um, I actually am very envious, envious of some of your jobs, but uh, <laughs> uh, honestly, but thank you because, you know, to me, it's really about building a community and, and building our state. Nevada has been um, such an incredible state and we have so many great natural resources. And I do believe that we are misunderstood uh, obviously, because we are the gaming capital of the world, but I actually think that we have the capacity to be the recreational capital of the West, and uh, I think we have the assets and the resources there, and I'm just going to finally make a plug um, to all of us to consider, you know, obviously, as we struggle through this uh, pandemic as a state, and look at how, how we suffer because we have not diversified our economy as much as we should. And to me, looking at the opportunities that we have to do that, but to me, it's investment in education and investment in workforce development. And um, love to partner with all of you, any of you on that issue, because ultimately I think that we need to look forward to what type, what what we're going to be when we grow up as a state, <laughs> and uh, and I believe that our natural resources should be a part, a key part of that portfolio. 
So I have to sign off, but I want to thank you for having me. Thank you for continuing all the hard work that you've done and count me as an ally and an advocate with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Craig, I'm going to share the last screen if you want to. Uh, all right. Well, once again, thank you all for, uh, for attending this and, and thanks so much to our panelists who do so much great work for us. And um, so I just want to tell you, these, so this will be up on our website here shortly. If you've attended this and you signed up for it, we're going to get you a link to it. Um, but keep an eye out for the next one. We're going to keep these going every month and we're going to try to keep bringing you wonderful panels and, uh, and wonderful topics to, to talk about. And if you, if you look on this, we have an email uh, on the screen. If you want to make sure you receive a registration for the next one, please get into, uh, the, please sign into this email or send an email to, to Brittany and we'll get you on our list and make sure. So thanks again. Everybody have a great night and it's probably cooled off enough we can go for a walk. <laughs>